Okay, for those who were asking for a video on multi-row panoramas, this is your video. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 81 of Understanding Dark Table. I'm still wrapping my head around the color calibration module, so that will be episode 82. So in the meantime, I figured whilst I'm on annual leave for a couple of weeks over the Christmas New Year period, and whilst I have Max at my disposal to help me out with the videoing, we should do the multi-row panorama episode. So it's over to me. Okay, so you want to shoot a multi-row multi-image panorama. As I mentioned in episode 75, if you're shooting multi-image, you want to shoot from left to right so that your thumbnails appear in the light table view in the correct order. Likewise, with a multi-row panorama, you want to shoot the top row of images before you shoot the middle row or middle rows, and then finally your lowest row because, again, you want the thumbnails to appear in a logical sequence in the light table view, so that when you look at that whole grid of thumbnails, you get at least an overview of what your multi-image, multi-row panorama should look like. Now, in terms of shooting multi-row, my thinking is that it's not because you can't get a wide enough view, because most of the time, even with a, you know, a 15 or a 20 mil wide angle lens, you can get a pretty wide angle of view. So my thinking is, if you want to shoot multi-row, it's probably because you want to shoot with a longer focal length and get higher resolution than what you would get by just shooting a single frame with a wider angle lens. So with that in mind, I've got my 2009 Alpha 850 with my favourite lens, a 135 f2.8 Prime. I absolutely love this lens as a portrait lens, but I'm going to use it today because I think it'll do the job for what we're trying to do. Now, if you look over my right shoulder, you can see East Gosford down there in the distance. And what I'm going to aim to do is do a multi-row panorama of the houses and shops of East Gosford. I know it's not the most thrilling subject matter, but I wasn't sure what else to do for, a, for an image subject. So this is what we're going to shoot. Now, I'm probably going to get more wind noise here. My apologies. But what I've done is I've looked at this scene and I've worked out that at 200 ISO and F14, I need about a 200th of a second shutter speed. And so what I've done is I've set my framing for what will be the top left frame of this composition. I've set my camera to a two second timer. As somebody pointed out after episode 75, you don't have to have a cable release. You can always use the two second timer. Why I didn't think of that, I don't know. So I will now shoot my top row of images using manual focus because a lot of what is going to be in this top row is just going to be sky and clouds. So trying to use autofocus is going to be challenging because the camera is not going to know where to focus. The clouds are always moving and there's nothing in the sky to focus on other than the clouds. So I still have this lovely Nodal Ninja 3 on loan from Anthony at ipanoramic.com.au. Anthony, thank you once again. Absolutely loving this thing. And what I love about this is because of the notches, I can set this back. When I come back to do the next row, I can set it back to the same number of degrees so that every frame starts pointing at exactly the same location. And because I'm shooting on a longer focal length, I've reduced the number of degrees of rotation with each click from 10 degrees down to 5 degrees. So I am going to start with this at 170 degrees and I will pan across, I don't know how many shots it's going to take me, let's find out. And I've ended up at 210 degrees, so about 9 frames. But 
Now I can simply come all the way around until I'm back to 170 degrees and I know that now I can set my next row of images and know that I'm pointing at exactly the same spot. Now what I'm about to put on screen is something I've knocked up in GIMP and it is an approximation of the focusing screen that I have in my A850. Now you'll notice that at the bottom of my focusing screen I've got a little black marker which would normally be one of my vertical thirds and I'm going to use that as the point at which I want to reorient the angle of the camera. So I'm going to move the equivalent black mark that's at the top of the frame down to that point and that will create my one-third overlap between the top row and the middle row. So now I can shoot my middle row. So that's my middle row shot and now I can position my upper third indicator where my lower third indicator is at the moment. So I've got my one-third overlap and now I can shoot my bottom row. Okay, so that is the three rows of nine images that I am going to shoot for this panorama. What I've got here, I could easily have got on a, even a 28mm lens would have covered this entire scene in one frame. But what we should end up with, once I've stitched all of this together, is an image with much greater resolution than we ever would have got out of a 28mm single frame. So let's take it home and stitch it together. You'll notice that the first image looks a little bit different. That is because I've gone in and done a little bit of retouching and I've made a subtle change to the white balance. So the next thing I need to do, obviously, is to synchronize that white balance to all of the other 26 images. Next up, I want to add some metadata, at least location information, if nothing else. And now I'm ready to export my high-res images as TIFF files ready to stitch in Hugen. Okay, all done. So now let's head over to Hugen. Well, I do not understand why this keeps failing. Whoa! And what's it done to my... <sighs> okay, so it's now the following day. And what happened yesterday was that three times I tried to stitch this panorama in Hugen, allowing Hugen to automatically allocate the control points across all of the image pairs. And three times the image came out completely distorted as you would have seen from the earlier footage. Uh, it was mapped on the globe and it was right down the bottom of the globe and it was all kind of crushed in at the bottom and if I dragged it up so that it sat more square then everything came out distorted uh, horizontally. And so that brought me to the horrible conclusion that when all else fails, your best method of attack is to start a new panorama project in Hugen, bring in your images and create the control points manually. Now that is a time consuming process, but the thing is, you don't need hundreds of control points. Honestly, if you've got four good control points between each image pair, that will generally do the job. So I've already done the manual placement of the image pair control points for the entire panorama, but I'm now going to demonstrate how you would do this, but I'm not going to go through and do the entire thing. So the way we would start is with a new project. We add all of the images that we want in our panorama. We will set our 
anchor point for position and exposure. And then you go to the control points tab and it starts with image zero loaded in both panes. We want image one in the second pane so that we are looking at our first image pair. So remember, we've got 27 images here. We've got nine images per row and we've got three rows. So if we've got nine images on a row, it means we've got eight image pairs, zero and one, one and two, two and three, through to seven and eight on the first row. Then on the second row, we've got nine through to 17. So there's another eight image pairs. And then on the bottom row, we've got 18 to 27. So another eight image pairs. So we've got 24 image pairs all up horizontally. But then we also need control points between image zero and image nine because they are the left top and left center row images. So we need control points between them. So we've got nine image pairs for top row and middle row, and then another nine image pairs for middle row and bottom row. So as you can imagine, there's quite a lot of control points to add. Now, how do we do it? What I recommend is you go to a 100% view, but before you do that, you have a quick look at the thumbnail of the entire image and you say to yourself, Okay, I need to stitch the right side of the left image to the left side of the right image. So what are the fixed points? Now, this is the critical thing. You want to add control points to objects which are fixed. Try and avoid clouds. Try and avoid boats on the water because those things move. Ideally, try and avoid trees unless they are big trees that don't move. Uh, houses, much better idea. So we can see that there is some common ground on the right hand side of the left image and the left hand half of the right image. So zoom to 100%, scroll across to the right hand side of our left image, scroll down until we find solid ground. So we've got a roof of a building over there but that's not going to be right on this left edge of this image. I think we're going to need to scroll in a bit. There it is. So what you want to do is activate this checkbox here, which says auto add. Now, what that's going to mean is that for the very first control point we add to this image, we're going to have to click on both images because we're saying to Hugen, these pixel coordinates on the left image correlate to these pixel coordinates on the right image. So what I would do, and, and remember, we are looking for areas of high contrast. That's going to give Hugen the best chance of creating a match. So I'm just going to take the right hand edge of where this roof disappears into the trees and click on the same point on the right hand side. And we can see that Hugen has automatically added that control point pair for both images. Now, the great thing is for all the other control points that we're going to add to this image pair, we only need to click on one of the two images and it doesn't matter which image we click on. Hugen will calculate the pixel coordinate difference between where our last control point was added and where we've just clicked and it will do the same coordinate match on the opposing image. Again, doesn't matter which image we choose and it will add the next control point. So we will start to scroll down here and we can just pick any high contrast area and click and immediately Hugen has found the same point on the other image and we can just continue through this adding more control points. And every time we click, as long as we're using the same overlapping part of the two images, Hugen will add the corresponding control point for us. So we've now got four control points for this image pair. Now we need to move to the next image pair. So we just click on this right arrow that moves image one to the left and brings image two into our right hand viewer. And it is simply a repetition of that process all the way through 
24 image pairs horizontally and then to do the vertical image pairs we'll just come back and load image zero on the left hand side and by the way you can click on this downward arrow and you know immediately choose whichever image you need in the left hand side viewer we want image zero and then in the right hand side we want image nine to create our vertical uh, control point matchups so this is the top left image of our panorama this is the left of the center row so in this instance, what we are looking for is to create control points across the width of the image where there are commonalities between the bottom of this image and the top of this image. So again, I would go to 100% zoom, scroll down till I find my houses and Again, we want the left-hand side of this image because remember, we're doing the width of the image now. We're not doing the sides of the image. So we scroll down till we find the same approximate area and we've still got auto add. So let's just pick this bright white section of this roof here. Click over here. Hugen has added that control point pair. Now all we want to do is move to the right, adding more control points as we go. And Hugen will continue to add all of these control points as it finds the same pixels in both images. And we can just keep on moving to the right until we've gone right the way across the width of our image. We can then zoom back out and we can see that we've now got 10 image pairs for that one pair of, uh, sorry, we've now got 10 control points for this image pair. Like I said, it's a time consuming process, but what I found was that when I did this across my entire project and I restitched it, we ended up with a much better result. Let's go and have a look. What's interesting here is that the thumbnail appears to have been cropped to only valid image data. However, when we open it up, we will see that there is actually the black border still around the image, like so. And now we have no distortion. There was none of that weird mapping that took place. And this was all because I went and manually created all of the control points. Now, Obviously, we would prefer not to have to do that. It's just going to vary from project to project. It's going to vary on the lens that you shot with. It's going to depend on how much parallax error you had between your images. There's a whole bunch of variables. I think also, Hugen, when I left it to its own devices, was probably trying to put control points where all of these trees are. Now, if the trees are blowing in the wind, it means that their relative positions from frame to frame are not going to be perfectly correlated to where they should have been. And that's going to have made Hugen think that there was far greater distortion than there was. And I suspect that that's what brought the whole thing undone when I allowed Hugen to create the control points. When I do it manually, I can look at the image and go, well, that's a tree. I'm going to not place control points there. And so now we have, I wouldn't say high res, but certainly much better than 24 megapixel resolution. I can actually zoom right in here to 100%. And you can see I've got quite good detail right down into the shops and the car parks and the parks and whatever in East Gosford. So hopefully this has helped. I'm not going to go through the post-processing in Darktable. I covered that in episode 77. But hopefully this has given you an idea about how to approach the shooting and the stitching for multi-row panoramas. All right, guys, best of luck with it. 
I guess the only other thing to mention, I saw uh, Jim Schmidt make mention of this in the comments on YouTube. He was trying to stitch astro panoramas of the Milky Way. And he was having issues where images are being, you know, if the center image is square, then the images to the side are being rotated like this and like this. And I think, as I said to him, it's because stars have a nasty habit of moving. And that probably doesn't help the situation when you're trying to allow the software to stitch automatically. I think for the guys who are really into the astro panoramas, they use other software that sort of takes into account all of those variables. And then you have, you know, robot panorama heads that calculate movement of stars and you know that's just a whole other rabbit hole to go down which i personally don't have the interest in pursuing i'm quite happy shooting these types of panoramas and stitching them together so hopefully that has been helpful for those of you who want to get into shooting multi-row panoramas I will leave it there. Any questions, comments, please sing out in the comments down below. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Click the thumbs up if you liked the video. Hope you had a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I will catch you in the next one. Oh my goodness. It looks like Santa came early. <laughs>